is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Lyriel, chapters 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21. In these chapters, poor Samoth, it looks like whatever happened to him when he was on the other side, while it did not entirely take hold the way it was meant to, which winds up being bad news for his buddy, it did something. Something's wrong. And uh, speaking of something being wrong, disreputable dog, what are you doing? What's going on? Because it feels like this disreputable dog is luring Lyriel towards something And I don't know what it is. I'm trying to hope that this thing is here for her benefit, but there's no real reason to think that. And overall, I'm just super nervous about Lyriel wandering around in all of these weird... I'm not an adventurer. We've established this. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. Many thanks to Abby for commissioning this episode, and thank you again to Abby also for her patience because I was late today. Um, so I am, oh, guys, the one of the storytelling devices that tends to work the best on me is the establishment of dread, which can be accomplished in a couple ways. But one of the best is to hint that something is going to happen and be pretty, like, vague about it, but, like, lay that groundwork. That's something that Stephen King can be really good at, at being, at saying something in such a way that you know it's bad news, but there's not anything to be done to avoid it. And you just have to wait till you get to the part of the story where he explains what he's hinting at. And the establishment of dread in this particular chapter, this first chapter, Nicholas and the Necromancer, that's some shit, guys. I don't care for this at all. Nicholas deserved better. Nicholas seems like kind of a badass. And I am very sad that he appears to have fallen victim to whatever it is that was supposed to happen to Samoth. And that is not to say that I dislike Samoth and want him to experience this either. It's just Nicholas has like kind of gotten on my good side because of his presence of mind in a emergency situation. You know, I've talked before on other shows about how a character can be straight up evil and I won't dislike them as much as I would if they were stupid. And that's something that I have to face in myself, that I would rather an intelligent evil than an, a good-hearted stupidity a lot of the time. But the surest way to my heart when it comes to characters is making them competent. Like, that's really the surest way to my heart in general. That's the best way to make me like you as a person. That's the best way to make me interested in you as a romantic partner. If you are competent, if you manage to keep your head in emergencies, if you manage to, like, see the bigger picture and and direct others in a way and, you know, be a leader that is you know, managing a group in such a way that it's efficient and going to be for the greater good. All of that is a way to get to me and make me like you. And Nicholas does that real hard in this section. So let's start talking about this. Chapter 17 starts with Sam returned to life to hear the harsh tap, tap, tap of machine gun fire and to see the landscape turned black and white by the stark brilliance of the parachute flares that were falling slowly through the rain. So shit has got pretty intense since he was over there in death. And he is sobbing with pain. So like quote unquote sobbing with pain. This motherfucker has got fucked up. Like, whatever it was that was supposed to finalize the spell on him, 
that might not have taken, but something is going on in him and it is ugly. Um, and he tried to speak, um, but his teeth were chattering from cold and he's like repeating to them the instructions that he was told. Someone touched his wrist and he screamed, the pain blinding him more than the flares that continued to blossom in the sky above. Then after the brightness, there was sudden darkness. Sam had fainted. And Nick is the one who sees the blistering finger marks on Samoth's wrist and says he's been burned. He's the one. And right there, you know, the fact that he observes this, that he is in this moment of real panic. They're being attacked. His friend is screaming. Just being able to detach himself from that panic enough to observe he's been burned immediately got, get me gets me going oh okay so you're listening you're watching i appreciate this um and the sergeant is telling him listen i am worried about sam too but we need to deal with this other thing he says the boys down there are driving the dead towards us and they must think we are already done for because they're not being real careful we'll be taking rounds any minute now if we don't clear off um so they need to signal that they are still alive, that they are, you know, potentially a target if these people don't uh, slow down and not send all of the dead up in this direction. And there's this moment. They'll get here before the guns rip them apart. I've seen it before and we'll get shot to pieces as well. He spoke slowly, almost dumbly, and Nick realized that he wasn't able to think that his brain had become saturated with danger and could not deal with the situation. Can we signal the soldier somehow? He shouted above yet another burst of fire. So at this point, they get hit with some sort of like, it's a rocket. They call it a tracer. Um, and when he f like gets a chance to ask again, if he can signal when he looks up, it appears that the sergeant is dead. He's in a pool of blood. It's really bad. Um, let's see. His fingers touched metal, the hilt of the man's sword. He would have flinched and drawn back, but at that moment, someone screamed behind him, a scream of such terror that his fingers convulsively gripped the weapon. Now, here comes a weird moment. And guys, this is not like me being like, this is bad writing. This is more like, distracting writing you ever have this where you're reading something and the wording that an author chooses to use it's not technically wrong but you're just realizing that this sort of aside makes you realize or re be reminded that the world isn't exactly in this book what you thought or what you keep like defaulting to so it says twisting around he saw one of the boys silhouetted grappling with a larger figure. It had him gripped around the neck and was shaking him around like a milkshake. Is that just me? Is that a weird, like, there's any number of things that they, that could be shaken around. And for some reason, the choice of words shaking him around like a milkshake specifically is very distracting. It just feels so like <laughs> Laura says, not just you, like who shakes a milkshake with a hand, right? Like when you say it, it almost feels like this person has never even had a milkshake before. And they just think that there's a shake in the word. And then it makes sense to just use that wording there. But if you've ever seen a milkshake made, it's usually made with some sort of blender. It's not shaken at all, actually. And also remembering that this universe probably has like, I don't know if it has like specifically hamburger restaurants, but that's what I always associate with milkshakes is obviously getting a burger. I have to keep reminding myself that this is a world that has like a lot of technology. It's just that all of that technology is in ancestor. Ancest and not 
above the wall, which is where we tend to spend most of our time as readers is above the wall. So I keep on reverting to thinking that things are like in a medieval setting when really they're not unless we're there and we're not there right now. But there's a whole, oh my God, Laura said at least he didn't say shake weight, which I guess. Abby says, this is the kind of thing where I would write it down in the moment and then put afterwards, find better simile, right? Like, I just feel like you could say a maraca, a rattle, you know, like we've got bells shaking him around like a bell, any number of other items, but shaking him like a milkshake just brought me up short and took me out of the scene so completely and made me go, wait, do they have milkshakes there? Which I shouldn't be asking a question about whether they have milkshakes during a battle scene. That shouldn't be where my mind is at, you know? But anyway, I just, I'm glad that you guys agree with me because I was just like, am I being a bad reader? Is this me getting like, being a little bit ADD and getting way too easily distracted? Um, Nick leapt up to help and he manages to like get this thing killed. But the kid that had been grabbed, Harry Ben Benlet, is already dead. And this is written in a way that's like pretty heartbreaking, actually. Harry Benlet's neck was broken and he would never take three wickets in a single afternoon ever again or hurdle every desk in the exam hall at Summersby just for the fun of it. You know, I like that. It's not like we know this character. It's not like I particularly care that he has died because I liked him or knew him. But framing it in that way just makes him a person unexpectedly to me as a reader, you know, and that is the way to give scenes like this some real stakes. So I just, it, it was sort of a weird whiplash because there's that milkshake thing, which makes me go, what the fuck are you doing? And then it's followed up by that, like really touching little human moment. And I was like, wow, you really like, I just can't decide how I feel about you with this writing in this scene. Um, so let's see. He realized three terrible facts that he had left Sam behind, that they absolutely had to signal the soldiers to avoid getting shot. And even if they kept moving, the dead would catch them before the soldiers finished off the dead. But with those dreadful realizations came sudden energy and a determination Nick had never known a clarity of thought that he'd never experienced before. So, he asks everybody to get out matches and anything that's dry and will burn. And this is followed by a really hilarious moment. Letters were proffered, dog-eared playing cards, and after a moment's hesitation, pages were torn from a notebook that had up till then contained what its owner imagined was his deathless prose. <laughs> I like to see things like that as the writer making fun of himself. Like... I don't know that that's what's actually going on here, but I really like whenever a writer says something that's sort of, duh, what's the word I want? Just kind of make, making fun of other writers. I like to think that's sort of directed at themselves because you can accomplish writing a book and even writing a successful book and still either have imposter syndrome or... Or have failed so many times before your success that you are aware maybe this is a fluke and like sort of talk shit about yourself. So I just really like that this is just like, you know, maybe he's thinking about when he was a, a young boy first starting out and how he really thought he was writing something great and looks back and is just like, oh, honey, um, I fancy myself being a decent writer and I look back at work that I have done and am horrified. And I don't mean look back at work that I did in high school. I mean, look back at work that I did a year ago. And I'm just like, oh, honey, what is this? So writing, it's part of why I haven't continued to write the series that I started because I have grown so afraid of actually reading what I wrote because I just have disappointed myself so many times now. It's just really hard. Um, but anyway, so finally they managed to get these things lit and they make a fire and use this to sort of signal that they are, oh, Abby says, Oh, that's so sad. Is it, is it sad Abby or is it a show of mercy on the world that I have not 
finished this and tried to get people to read it. Oh, who can know? Um, so he then starts handing out orders. Ted, will you and Mike crawl around and drag Sam back here? Stay off the crest. Be careful of his wrist. He's burnt. I'm going to find the necromancer, the man who controls the things out there. I suggest everyone else start singing so the army knows there are real people here by the fire. You'll have to keep the creatures away, too, so I'm going to try and draw closer ones after me. Um, and they ask him what to sing, and he says, sing the school song, because it's what I think everybody probably knows. Um, and this leads to a really weird like scene that I would like to see on film a little bit where he starts to like sprint away into the darkness as everything is like, you know, fucking going off and his friends are behind him singing this school song and this sort of, it's just, it feels a little surreal, you know? Um, the words of the school song were suddenly caught off as Nick left the trees, smacked into a stone wall, tumbled over it and fell down six or seven feet into the sunken road. The sword spun out of his hand and his palms skidded across asphalt, which took off most of the skin. Ugh. He lay in the road for a moment, gathering his wits, then started to get up. He was on his hands and knees when he became aware that someone was standing right in front of him. Leather boots with metal plates at the knee clanked as whoever it was stepped forward. So you've come as ordered, even without Sereneth, to seal the pledge, said the man, his voice somehow turning off all the other sounds that had filled Nick's ears. Gunfire, grenade explosions, the singing, all of it was gone. All he could hear was that terrible voice, a voice that filled him with indescribable fear. So that's pretty fucked up. And he tells him to lift up his hand... And Nick isn't able to resist. This is like a command that somehow forces him to move in a certain way. And he... I hate this so much, guys. I'm going to read this. The necromancer's hand stopped several inches away, and something quivered under the skin of his palm like a parasite trying to get out. Then it was free, a sliver of silver metal that slowly oriented itself toward Nick's open hand. It hung suspended for another second, then it suddenly leapt across the gap. Nick felt it strike his hand, felt it break through his skin and enter his bloodstream. He screamed, his body arched back in convulsions, and for the first time the necromancer saw his face. "'You are not the prince!' shouted the necromancer, and his sword flashed through the air straight at Nick's wrist." But it stopped suddenly, less than a finger's width away, as the convulsion stopped and the boy looked up at him calmly, cradling his hand to his chest. Inside that hand, the sliver of arcane metal swam, negotiating the complex pathway of the boy's veins. It was weak here on the wrong side of the wall, but not too weak to reach its ultimate destination. It hit Nicholas Sayre's heart a minute later and lodged there. A minute later still, puffs of thick white smoke began to issue from his mouth. Hedge waited, watching the smoke, but the white smoke suddenly dissipated, and Hedge felt the wind swing around to the east and his own power diminish. He heard the sound of many hobnailed boots farther up the road, and the whoosh of a flare being fired directly overhead. So, first of all, that last name, Sare. That's familiar. Who's that? What's that about? That feels like something. Hedge winds up, like, taking off and watching as all of these um, charter mages from the army come and pick this kid up. And he realizes that, like, he's outnumbered, that they are all skilled with magic and even if he could have like taken a couple of them all of them together he definitely couldn't and he is a little bit bummed out because this is not how this plan was supposed to go this is a bad thing um but everything else has gone according to plan so he's sort of hoping that he can just come back for samoth some other time and at this point nick who is was in horrible pain for a moment seems to be mostly fine 
and later on is like allowed to leave the the hospital and we don't actually find out what the fuck happened to him all we know is that he's some sort of ticking time bomb there is something that was like pushed into his body that remains there and we do not know what it was what it was meant to do it would have been easy to think that yeah this is to kill you but why like if the necromancer had wanted to just kill samoth he could have done it in death you know like and he doesn't do that so obviously he's planting some kind of seed but I don't know what it is, and I don't really want to know what it is, low-key. I'm going to be honest with y'all. I'm not excited for this to, like, come to fruition, whatever this is. And especially that moment of it saying, on this side of the wall, it was weaker. That is the part that gives me the greatest pause, because Nicholas sends a message, or he leaves a note for Samoth, basically being like, hey, buddy. Uh, so everything's fine. No need to worry. I'm thinking about coming to visit you up there. What do you think? Which for me feels like he, I, and, and this is sort of a question, right? Nicholas, it does not seem, rem, he, I don't think he remembers what happened to him. I'm not positive about that, but it feels like he is being motivated by forces outside of himself to get somewhere that this thing would have more power. And that makes me wonder how much control he has of himself in general at this point, you know, like how much of his movement is dictated by somebody else and how much of it are his own decisions. Like, is he basically a puppet? Is that what this thing is, is meant to like control him so that, because I could see using the prince who's the closest to the abhorson as a sort of puppet i could see that being an incredible advantage to her enemies so yeah you know like that's something that maybe that was the whole thing is to implant this thing that simultaneously controls and erases memory of its implantation which i don't care for that at all it's basically like being possessed but not by an undead thing. So I would assume the abhorson would not sense it. And that's pretty fucking terrifying. But I guess we'll find out. I don't know. I don't know. Um, so let's see. Two, two, two. Oh, yeah. Here we go. As uh, Hedge fled into the darkness, stretcher bearers picked up Nick. A young officer convinced the schoolboys on, school on the hill that they really could stop singing, and Ted and Mike tried to tell the barely conscious Sam what had happened as an army medic looked at the burns on his wrist and legs and prepared a surret of morphine. So then we go to chapter 18, titled A Father's Healing Hand. And this is pretty brutal. Um, first of all, this never occurred to me, but if you are somebody who is in tune with death, the way the Abhorson is, the way that Samoth is, who will be an Abhorson, I would imagine, eventually. Um, being in a hospital where a lot of people have died is really fucking terrible. And it's just kind of an oppressive sense of death at all times. And he is constantly freezing cold because of the sense of it invading him. And he isn't able to drive off that sensation the way that he would normally because he is drugged up. Essentially, they keep on like pumping him full of morphine and that weakens his abilities. So he isn't able to sort of like back away from this sensation and protect himself, which uh, I guess these doctors don't really have any understanding of magic or how this stuff works. And that was kind of startling to me because I don't know how, if you are a doctor living in this world where you know magic is a thing, how you don't become obsessed with figuring out how magic works and all of the various ways that magic could be applied medically. I feel like that would be all I would ever want to know about. And it would probably come at the expense of my actual practice and my, you know, human abilities, because I would just become 
enamored with the idea of being able to do things that I can't as a regular person. Um, so they are, there's like another scene later where the doctor seems completely like bewildered by stuff that they've done using magic to heal him. And I'm just like, dude, how have you not educated yourself about this stuff yet? Like, but I feel that way about a lot of things that are in the world as well, that there are things that I would think people would want to know about because it's just to your advantage to educate yourself as much as possible about certain things. And people just aren't interested or don't bother or, you know, and I just cannot understand that. So it stands to reason that that would exist in any sort of world. Um, Abby says, I don't think Ancestorians do though, unless they grew up very close to the wall. How does the existence of magic, like the, that news not travel? That's crazy. Laura says, yeah, I agree. Not to mention the army doesn't want to acknowledge its existence. Why would other institutions? And this is what I mean. You don't want to acknowledge its existence. You have just been attacked by an army of dead. 15 years ago, there was almost an incursion into your territories via an undead army and a necromancer. I'm sorry, you don't get to pretend this isn't real. You're idiotic. Like, why would you do that? It's just, it, it's so foolish. Abby says, mass hallucination, gas leak. Like, genu genuinely asking, what is the advantage of pretending this isn't real? When there are people out there who are able to do this, and they are walking around with symbols in their heads that fucking glow. And you don't, like, what are you talking about? Why would, but you know what? We also live in a society in which the government tells us that global warming isn't real and we're all going to die and nobody cares. So I guess this is just par for the course. Is there money to be made by pretending magic isn't real? Because if that's the case, then this all makes sense. And never mind. <laughs> um, Laura says no one has to explain. Wait, sorry. I jumped ahead. Abby says, again, though, they only glow in Ansel Sierra and you're near the wall and the wind is blowing from the north. No one has to explain a superior 500 miles south who has never been near the wall or heard of the charter that a bunch of black magic happened. Yeah, maybe. And I didn't realize the blowing from the north is what makes them glow but that's interesting okay cool um all right so anyway this is just so funny to me like come on it's not it's really interesting too that that's the choice that's being made here it's sort of simple uh similar to what's up in the dresden files technically in the dresden files there's supposed to be like secrecy about magic Dresden doesn't really worry about it because he recognizes that most human beings are so unwilling to acknowledge the realities of a world containing magic that he doesn't have to lie because nobody actually wants to believe it as much as they kind of want magic to be real in the way that we all do because of fantasy. Once we have to see creatures that are supernatural and predatory then we start to wish we didn't know. And it's it's sort of interesting to me that there's this whole, like, you know, magical system that exists here and nobody has made any effort the way they have in Harry Potter to, like, keep things secret. There's no statute of secrecy. There's no anything like that. It's just human beings being who they are and not wanting to fucking acknowledge shit they don't understand. Um, so, okay. Chapter 18. He dreamed of bodiless creatures that would come from death and finish off what the necromancer had begun, and he could not wake himself from the dreams. When he did wake, he often saw that same necromancer stalking toward him and would scream and scream until the nurse, who it really was, gave him another injection and started the cycle of nightmares again. Sam suffered four days of this, drifting in and out of consciousness without ever really waking up and never losing his sense of death and the fear that accompanied it. Accompanied it. Sometimes he was lucid enough to realize that Nick was there too, in the next bed, his hands bandaged. Sometimes they talked briefly, but it wasn't ever a real conversation since Sam could neither answer questions nor continue whatever talk Nick began. So this is just really 
really fucked up that he has four days of them just not dealing with like what he has actually experienced and gone through because they apparently lack the capacity to acknowledge that they there is something in the world they don't understand um i.e magic and necromancy so this poor kid is being essentially tortured by having to live in this like nightmare in between for fucking four damn days um finally he feels somebody touching him and at first he's like freaked out and then he realizes that that touch is not cold the way the others have been um and it's not burning it is comforting and it says a grip that somehow led him out of the nightmare lifting him up through a sky that was all charter marks and sunshine. When Sam opened his eyes, he could clearly see for the first time his vision clear of the drug haze and vertigo. He felt fingers resting lightly on his neck on the pulse there and knew his father's hand before he even looked up. Touchstone was right next to him. His eyes closed as he directed a healing spell into his son's body, the marks flashing under his fingers as they left him and entered Sam. So I love this. Sam is so happy to see his dad. And he is that kind of happy that when you reach Samus age, you start to be a little bit embarrassed that you still feel when you see your parent. And I really liked that line that he's like low key glad that his father's eyes are closed so that his dad won't see the expression on his face and how pleased he is that his father is there. Um, I'm very curious about whether if Nicholas were still here by the time his father got here. And I think it's significant that Nicholas is gone once his dad gets here, because again, that sort of ties in with my, my theory that this kid is either being controlled by an outside force using whatever was implanted in him to control him or is being controlled from within by a sort of self preservation mechanism in this thing that entered him. I feel like he was somehow directed to get up and leave before touchstone got there so that he could avoid detection. But then that begs the question of if hedge had been trying to implant that into Samoth. Is it possible to detect this that easily? Because he ha he would have to assume that Samoth's dad was going to come and visit and touch him. And so he would have had to be prepared for the eventuality that detection was possible. So I don't know. There's a couple of things going on there that sort of conflict, I guess. And maybe, maybe his, like Nicholas is not being there is totally coincidental. Maybe that has nothing to do with Touchstone being there. But I just felt so strongly that it wasn't a coincidence that he was gone. But yeah, if like Touchstone, of course, if his son had been in the middle of this battle, would have come and, and seen him, I would assume, and touch him and realize that there was something going on. So maybe, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. This is all sort of conflicting. We'll see. Um, they almost hugged until Sam saw there were two doctors, four of the Touchstone's guards, and two Ansel Stieren army officers in the ward, as well as a whole crowd of Ansel Stieren police, soldiers, and officials gathered down the corridor peering in. So they just like grip forearms because it's unmanly to show that you're glad to see that your son is alive. <sighs> Masculinity, guys. It is just so stupid sometimes. I swear to God. Um, both doctors were amazed that Sam was even conscious. And one checked the chart at the foot of the bed to affirm that the patient really had been receiving intravenous morphine for days. Really, this is impossible, the doctor began, till a cold glance from one of the Touchstone's guards convinced him that the conversation was currently not required. A slight further movement convinced him that his presence was not required either, and he backed away to the door. Yeah, guy, get the hell out of here. So, 
Touchstone asks his son, how are you doing? Do you think you can ride? And his son is just like, ride? Are we doing this already? And he's like, yeah, this is obviously not much safer for you than anywhere else. We sent you here because we thought it was getting you out of the middle of everything. And evidently that's not what happened. So there's not really any point in leaving you here. He says, the police caught your bus driver. He was bribed with old kingdom silver deniers. So bus driver, buddy, I really want to know how much you got paid because a bunch of people died. God, like, I just can't. I can't. There's so much about this that I wonder. I This is the shit that I get hung up on where it's just this little side thing. The bus driver was bribed to bring you to a certain place and then book. But... I low-key want a chapter from the bus driver's perspective. I want to find out how he was approached. I want to find out what he was told was going to happen. I want to find out what he thought he was going to do to hide because everybody fucking apparently knows who he is. And I want to know what his reaction was when he found out what had actually gone on. Was he repentant or was he just like, well, whatever, a bunch of rich kids who fucking cares. Like there is just so much about this that feels heartless and terrible to me. But there's also the possibility that he was not told what was going to happen. And there are a couple of like different things that I've read and watched where somebody was bribed to do something seemingly innocent. And it turned out to be like um, there was a Poirot episode where a guy who answers the phone at the airport was paid to tell a woman who was trying to book a flight that there were no available bookings until a certain day and time so that she would have to take that particular flight. And he was bribed to do this. And it just seemed like such a nothing little thing. And then it turns out that her killer had to be on that same flight with her and they killed her while they were in the air. And that person took this bribe thinking that it was just like, Oh, they just want her to, you know, for some reason, take this particular one. And if you're being generous, you can frame that. However, if you're getting that call and somebody's like, do me a favor and tell her that this, this, and this, or then you can be like, oh, maybe it's somebody who really wants her to like arrive at a certain time. Maybe they have a plan. Maybe somebody's going to propose. Maybe it's a surprise. You can make it seem like it's going to be something nice and then find out later, oh no, that woman was murdered and it's kind of your fault. Like, you know, I just really wonder about this bus driver. So I'm saying guys, I know I'm distracted about a thing that doesn't matter. But anyway, Sam is a little bit upset because his mother is not there. And even as he like says it, that he's upset she's not there. And he doesn't even say I'm upset. He's just kind of like, well, where is she? It's an interesting combination of things going on here. First of all, he is feeling very embarrassed at the fact that he cares so much that she's not there. Like he is, he's embarrassed because he himself doesn't like being at the age that he is and still wanting his mother. He's embarrassed because he thinks that it looks really pathetic to be wanting his mom. He's embarrassed that as much as he can tell he's being petulant, he can't seem to stop himself from saying the things out loud and sort of like, you know, I think we've all been in this position at some time or another where we have been able to like step back enough from our own behavior to see that we're acting like a dick, but we haven't exactly been able to stop ourselves because our emotions have sort of taken over. And so he's there right now, which is understandable because he just went through some really terrible trauma. And on top of all of that, is his father's reaction to him being upset that his mother isn't there because he's worried that his father is going to sort of reprimand him for his disappointment. He thinks that his dad isn't going to have the patience and it sort of seems more like touchstone is upset also that she's not there. Not that he's blaming her, 
Like he's not resentful in the way that you would if you felt like this was like a, you know, a mother actually shirking her responsibilities to her son or anything like that. It's much more, he resents the fact that she is the only abhorsen and is the only person that can be called on to take care of a bunch of things that are going on. And that is a really terrible, terrible place to be in a relationship. Like not saying that they don't love each other because clearly they do. And he clearly admires his wife and she is very brave and everybody really respects her. But I have had a couple relationships where the guys that I've been with have been like low key workaholics. And there is a feeling of, and it's not like they are always in a position where they could call on somebody else to do the work for them. And they don't most of the time they are workaholics because they recognize correctly that nobody else is really up to doing what they do and they can't rely on anybody else. So you are then in this position where you are watching somebody that you care about push themselves so hard and be constantly on call, constantly needing to be available in a way that is like borderline unhealthy. And yet there isn't really an alternative. There isn't something else that could be done. It's not like they are ignoring you because they don't care or are actually placing you second. It is because they take their responsibilities seriously and they have made promises to other people or they have, you know, their own reputation at stake, whatever. And that's so much worse. It's so much worse than when that's the case. If if somebody is actually treating you as second important in their life to their work, it's a lot easier to point to that and be like, that's fucked up. I don't like that you're doing this. I don't like that you see me this way. I don't like that I'm not a priority for you. And you can like, you know, address that. But when it's something like this, where they are genuinely the only person equipped to handle this problem, really, there is nobody else capable of doing the things that they do. And it is a life or death situation on top of it. You can't say anything and not be the asshole who's needy and putting himself before the well-being of other people. And this is what I feel like it would be like to date a doctor, somebody who's like a surgeon who's at the top of their field. And, you know, you respect and love the fact that they are very good at what they do and that they care about other human beings and that they want to help. And at the same time, everything you love about them that makes them who they are is part of what makes you so sad so much of the time because it's what causes them to get called away and ruin time that you would have had together. So what I'm saying is I really feel for Touchstone and I really feel for Samoth because Sam is trying so much to be understanding, but he's grown up with a mother that is constantly absent for very, very valid, good reasons. And it's hard to not take that sort of thing personally, even when you know that's not what it is, and then judge yourself because you are not being reasonable even though you kind of are being reasonable, like you can still have your feelings hurt, even when you know it wasn't intentional. And that guilt that then follows up being sad and feeling abandoned is just as toxic as anything. So, ah, uh, poor Sam, poor Touchstone, like, you know, this is what happens when you are involved with or the child of somebody really talented and really unusual. Um, so Sam asks, like, because his father says to him, um, you've suffered an injury of the spirit that will take time to heal for it is beyond my power to repair. What do you mean? Asked Sam anxiously. He felt very young all of a sudden, not at all like the nearly adult prince he was supposed to be. Can't mother fix it up? I don't think so, said Touchstone, resting his hand on Sam's shoulder, the small white scars from years of sword practice and actual fighting bright across his knuckles in the hospital light. But then I cannot tell the nature of it, only that it has happened. I would guess that as a result of your going into death unprepared and unprotected, some small fragment of your spirit has been leached away. Not much, but enough to make you feel weaker or slower, basically less than yourself. But it will come back in time. 
And Sam asks if his mom is furious with him. And Touchstone is like, of course she's not. She thinks that you did what was necessary and it was very brave. And she's probably just more worried about you than anything. Um, and then we get this thing where he says, you know, we received word she'll be, she'll meet us at Belisere if she doesn't have to go somewhere else, said Sam. Unless she has to go somewhere else, agreed Touchstone, as calmly as ever. His father worked hard at staying calm, Sam knew, for there was old berserker blood in him, and Touchstone feared its rise. Did we know this? Has there been any mention of the berserker blood in Touchstone before? I don't remember this. Abby says we did. Okay. I did not remember at all. Um, the only time Sam had ever seen that fury was when a false ambassador from one of the northern clans had tried to stab Sabria with a serving fork at a formal dinner in the palace. Touchstone, roaring like some terrible beast, had picked up the six-foot barbarian and hurled him the length of the table onto a roast swan. Which is pretty amazing, and I want to see it. I'm not going to lie. Abby says he bit at the end of Sa oh it's probably the bit the bit at the end of Sabriel where they got shot at and he picked Sabriel up and ran and ran and ran all the way to where the Claire twins were leaving the shooters far behind. Oh, I forgot about that. Right, 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 right. Okay, cool, cool. Um that's fun. I like that. Okay. So he gets dressed and he gets this that note from Nicholas. And it's just a lot of like joking around, describing what happened. Um, he doesn't actually remember. He just says, I fell down and knocked myself out. I don't know if he's lying and has been taken over by somebody else or if he really doesn't remember and has been taken over by somebody else. Um I understand the army got hold of your pater and he's coming to take you home so you won't be finishing term. I dare say I won't bother either since I already have my place at Sunbear. Um, and he says, it won't be the same without you or Harry Benlet or even Cochrane. They found him five miles away the next morning, apparently gibbering and frothing. And I expect he's locked up in Smith and Special Hospital by now. Should have been done years ago, of course. So that's like sad. It's simultaneously amusing and sad because Cochrane was just so insufferable in the short time that we knew him. Um, and then he says, I might come and visit you. Um, and talks about the no undoubted scientific explanation for everything that happened, which is just ludicrous. Um, and he also says the officers wanted you to sign something, a non-disclosure agreement, um, which I also had to sign. I told them you weren't even a citizen. Something tells me the right hand knoweth not what the left hand doeth, since they were from Corvée Legal Affairs, and the guards outside are from the Perimeter Scouts. I was interested to note the latter belonged to your peculiar religion, with the caste mark or whatever it is on their foreheads. Not that sociology is really in my field of interest, I hasten to add. Um, so then... The aged parents have sent some sort of private undersecretary to the oversecretary Chamberlain of the personal privy type of fellow to collect me and take me to Aberdeen Court. Apparently, father is too busy with a Souther, uh, Southerling refugee problem. I wonder if that's really actually who sent the person that is collecting him or if he has just been told that and is being spirited away by somebody who is not supposed to have custody of him. Um, but I guess we will find out. And Sam is happy to have heard from his friend and find out that he's okay and all of this. So he heads home and we find out that, uh, his sister, once he gets home, has been named co-regent. And that's because she is 14 months older than him, which damn, Sabriel, you are apparently just like pregnant for years at a time here. Um, and he is simultaneously like glad to not have that responsibility on himself, but also thinks that her being elevated to that point is going to make her insufferable. It seems though that she is in the right on how she is handling everything. She's taking it seriously. She is doing her duty. She's making sure that everything is like 
all of their schedules are balanced with what they are meant to cover. And she isn't playing at being queen. She is doing her best to make this a good, smart period of, of learning and efficiency and recovery. So I respect the hell out of Elamir already. Um, Meanwhile, his uh, mother isn't even there yet. She had come and then left again because there is somebody who is like, uh, it says free magic sorcerer come bandit chief who was attacking travelers along the northern extremes of the nail way. Um, and uh, let's see, touchdown had been gone only an hour when Elamir came looking for Sam. She comes and wakes him up. And is uh, yelling at him. They wind up fighting over the blanket until it literally tears in half, which I find hilarious. And tell she tells him about all of the shit that he has to do. The way that this is described is exhausting. I am going to read this to you guys. First of all, she tells him that his responsibility this year is to learn the dance for the Midsummer Festi Festival because he's going to be playing the part of the Bird of Dawning. And he is horrified, does not want to do this. And she's just basically like, tough. This is what you have to do. Get over it. And she really does seem to have that attitude towards herself as well. I have a feeling that if she were in the position where she needed to do this dance, that she probably wouldn't like it any better. And she also would not complain about it at all. So she has a sort of like maturity to her, I sense, that he hasn't got yet, but maybe he will. Um... So let's see. I've also scheduled you to sit with Jal at the petty court every morning between 10 and one, and you'll have sword practice twice a day with the guard, of course, and you must come to dinner. No ordering meals to your grubby workshop. And per for perspective, I've assigned you to work with the scullions every second Wednesday. Sam groaned and sank back on the bed. Perspective was Sabriel's idea. For one day every two weeks, Elamir and Sam would work somewhere in the palace, supposedly like the ordinary people there. Of course, even when they were washing dishes or mopping floors, the servants could rarely forget that Sam and Elamir would be prince and princess again tomorrow. Most of the servants dealt with the situation by pretending Sam and Elamir weren't there, with a few notable exceptions like Mistress Finney, the falconer, who shouted at them like everybody else. So perspective was usually a day of drudgery performed in strange silence and isolation. And this is one of those things that, like, I really love and hate the idea that you should try and, like, do the jobs that you take for granted as being done for you all the time, I think is really, really smart. But I also don't love that it's every second Wednesday. What, they do this twice a month for, like, the day and that's it? That, I don't feel, is enough to really get into a kid's head how tedious and never ending that sort of work is I feel like this should be a permanent part of every day and that should just be part of his chores but you know whatever I guess he can't fit that in with everything um but yeah I also like the idea that, because it really is it's like an undercover boss situation except everybody 100% knows that this is a boss so it's just sort of like weird because you can't treat them the way that you would a servant and hold them to the same standards with work as you would a servant because the next day you're going to have to be serving them again right so it's like it depends on the type of person you are but it could go either way if you treat them really harshly and hold them to the same standard they could either take it to heart that most servants are treated this way and have a like deeper empathy and compassion for servants because of how hard their work is, or they could simply take it personally and then lash back out at you. Once the power is back in the place that it's supposed to be and take, just get their revenge. And that's all dependent on like their personality. So I guess we'll see how that goes, but yikes. Um, it's a, it's something that's like a really good idea, I think, but in practice might not work out super well. Um, he asks her what she's doing for perspective. I'm just realizing that I'm not even halfway. I'm, I have like six minutes left. I got to fast forward guys. Um, but she has given herself a job that's also tough and a lot of work. And so he can't even like really be mad at her. She hands him a book that their mother gave her to hand off to him. And as soon as he touches it, he basically completely drains of color, turns ice cold, starts shaking 
and she doesn't understand his reaction and really neither does he. And it turns out that this is a book of the dead. And she says something about how she's glad that she doesn't have the aptitude for it because this means that she is going to be the one that's like in charge of actual running of the state. And he is going to be the one that's the abhorsen. And she really prefers that. But seeing his reaction to this concerns her and she isn't really sure what to do. He insists, even though he's flipping out and shaking still, that it will pass and he will be better soon. But there's not really a reason to know that, I don't feel like. I think he's just saying that to her. Um, I don't know. We'll see. And he finally, like, picks up the book again. And there's a note from his mother. And it's like, you know, one of those notes where there's, it's a, like a recording. And she is apologizing for not being able to be there for him so much of the time. Um it is telling him that she's sure that his spirit will recover from whatever attack happened to him. And she talks about giving him the book of the dead, which is part of his heritage and that you need to start reading it and mastering what's in here because I'm going to need your help. And she, it ends with, we'll speak of this um, more on my return, but for now I want you to know I'm proud of you and your father is too. And welcome home. Um, the future, so bright when that cricket ball had arced over the stands for a six, now seemed very dark indeed. So chapter 20, A Door of Three Signs. I don't have a lot of time left, but there actually, as much as does happen here, it's easily summed up. Muriel, it's been three years. She has mastered the transformation into an animal for diff three different animals. One of them is an uh, ice otter. Another is a bear and then an owl. And each of those has its own advantages because of size, because of eyesight, all of this stuff. But also when she turns back into herself and climbs out of those skins, cause it's like a physical thing that she has to put on she retains some of their vulnerabilities as well. So she wants certain foods really bad for days afterwards, or her eyesight is like re very sensitive to light or whatever. And she has been busy exploring the library with the dog and it's her birthday and she's turning 17 and she is still does not have the sight, which I mean, I think we can all assume is just never going to happen for her, but she has still not really gotten over it. Um, and is just kind of unwilling to see herself as a fully grown person if she do doesn't have it. You know, there are guys who are like sort of trying to approach her romantically at this point, and she has no interest and doesn't really even understand that's what's happening because she just doesn't think that anybody would want to be with her when she doesn't have the sight because that to her is unthinkable, which is kind of amazing. Like, I remember being hit on when I was young and not knowing that was what was going on at the time because I assumed that I was so unattractive that no, that if anybody was hitting on me, they were doing it as a mean joke. And um, that kind of feels like where she is right now. And for her birthday, first of all, she gets to be second assistant librarian, which means that she gets a red uh, vest instead of the, I think, yellow one, which is what she had had. Um, and she and the dog are going and exploring this particular... Oh, she's turning 19, says Abby. Ugh, poor thing. She needs to she needs to get it in. Maybe to loosen her up a little bit and calm her down. Um, and she is, like, going to this particularly tight tunnel that she needs to turn into an otter to get through. And it's a weird thing because like it takes her literal hours to get in and out of these skins and prep them and everything. Like it's a huge fucking production. And once she gets to the end of this tunnel, there's this doorway that she has to turn back into a person to get through. And the dog is very encouraging of her basically getting in trouble for the sake of this and keeps telling her like some things are worth it. 
in a way that makes me feel like the door, the dog is totally aware of what's behind that door and knows what's going to happen and is like here. Uh, like, is, is the dog future Lyriel coming back to help present Lyriel? Like there's something about this all that just feels like planted and Lyriel is not suspicious enough in my opinion of all of this, but, she winds up getting through the door. Her blood is drawn by a charter sending that's sort of testing to make sure that she's actually a person. And she has a momentary like, oh, this thing knows that I'm not a Claire and it could, t and the dog's like, it let you through. Clearly you're Claire. What are you talking about? And she's like, I'm not. And finally the dog is like, I am sick of this. You are so self-pitying. You're sitting here. There's this door that's like really weird that you should open and go and explore. And all you can do is sit here and fucking whine to yourself and gripe to me about some shit that you can't change or control. So fucking stop and get over it. And finally, she gets up and pushes the door open. The sending probably unlocked it for you. She goes through, there is a long ass tunnel, all of this like traveling, going down deeper and deeper until finally she gets to a door that says Lyriel's path. She thinks at first that it's a crypt and that it's like, you know, got her name on it. And the dog is like, first of all, there have been a lot of Lyriel's. Second of all, what do you think is more likely that there was another Lyriel that got buried here or that there was... Somebody who came from the past or the future and dug a crypt for you. Like, what are you fucking talking about? So, and then the dog, when she sees that it's not a crypt and that it says Lyriel's path, guess you should go through then, said the dog. Even if you're not the Lyriel whose path it is, you are a Lyriel, which in my book is a pretty good excuse. So, she winds up going through and eventually gets to an underground river which is clearly there as some sort of security measure. And as she's doing this, she can feel something really strange around her, which I'm going to assume is her sense of death being like, because I have just been assuming this whole time that she has a horse and blood in her. Um, and she says, I can feel it all around me. There's, it's like sort of an itch. Um, there are always Claire who are sensitive to death. That's what you feel. You shouldn't be afraid of it. I'm like, mm, okay. So when they get to the, um, the river, let's see, as the poet had it, a swift river born in deepest night, rushing forth to catch the light Deep ice and dark its swaddling cloth, the kingdom's foes will feel its wrath, till mighty Rattlin spends its strength in the delta at full length. Um, and the dog says that this is the source um, of the Rattlin, which is apparently like a huge river. And there's a question about whether or not this thing is here to keep things out or to keep things in. Um, oh, Laura says it's the same river that the Abhorsen's house is on. Oh, neat. Okay, cool. So that is how that chapter ends, is wondering whether or not it's keeping something in or out, which is, uh, you know, sufficiently upsetting. I don't like either of them, to be honest. I just don't like all the dead creatures in this world. It's creepy. One of the things that Sabriel was off doing when her son was hurt was like taking care of some ferryman who had one of those things riding on it in his back. Ugh. Ugh. Horrifying. I hate it. Um, but you know, what are you going to do? All right. So that's the end of the chapter. I'm going to have to wrap up, but thank you again to Abby for the commission and to Abby and Laura for hanging out with me in the chat. My apologies for being tardy, but I hope that, uh, you forgive me. And I will hopefully be seeing you all again soon with a new episode. So until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers.
was an unspoiled network podcast.